Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this stream. Um, I'm Alex. I'm hosting this talk with uh, BC Manjanath G today. Um, uh, before I introduce Manjanath, I'll um, just say a couple of minutes um, about the algorithmic pattern theme. So if you would still like to get yourself a drink or are still getting settled, you have a bit of time before the main bit. But um, yeah, so this is um, the fourth um, talk in the in this series of events. We started with a talk on weaving from Laura Devendorf, a talk on wire bending in Trinidadian uh, Carnival uh, by Vanel Noel. And then we uh, last week we had a talk by Ron Eglash on um, uh, decolonial computing and craft uh, uh, grammars. Um, and uh, yeah, so so far we've already explored um, patterns in textiles, in um, mass making, and um, in all kinds of um, heritage algorithms. Um, and this week we're going to look at conical. Uh, this uh, is going to be less of a talk, more of a discussion with Manjunith, um, and that's true of the um, next three, uh, the, the two talks afterwards as well. So um, feel free to ask questions in the YouTube comment box um, throughout this session, and uh, we'll bring them in um, as we go. Uh, so yeah, and also feel free to introduce yourself um, and say hello. So we know you're there because <laughs> we can't see you, unfortunately, across the internet. Um, right. So without further ado, let's um, introduce uh, Manjanath. Uh, hello. <laughs> hello. Good to see you. Um, let me organize things slightly there. Um, so, yes, um, it's a real pleasure to have you. Um, you're uh, um, a well-known face on on the internet, I think, but also uh, you have um, your uh, very respected musician, um, uh, teacher, um, both in India and also you tour regularly in Europe and around the world, I believe. Um, I don't think there's many um, concert halls in Europe that you haven't performed in. <laughs> uh, uh, as far as I know, but of course, the thing that's unknown is more than the known. So yes, that's, that's what I would like to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, there's always more to do, which is um, something which I've really enjoyed enjoyed about Conocol. I think is that um, uh, coming across this over the last year um, and uh, exploring it um, through your videos and also through tuition with you, which I've been very lucky to enjoy. Um, it feels like there's always one more step beyond what I'm doing, which completely changes everything. <laughs> but um, I think there'll be people in the stream who are not really familiar with Conical. So maybe the first question is how how do you kind of try to explain it to people who haven't come across it before? Uh, well, Conical uh, is something that's uh... I would say if we start exploring it, it, you will realize more and more. It's very natural to to human body or the way we think about anything, like even about life. I experience it's 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 a way of life for me. It's not a, an art form for me because I don't treat it as something that is separate from my own self. Uh, in in very simple words, to put it. You can say it's kind of like a coded language for musical rhythms. Or if you want to uh, be a little bit more detailed about it, uh, it's it's a language of rhythms because it's majorly dealing with rhythms. Uh, you need not actually ha have any instrument to discuss music if you can get into Konoko a little bit and then um, there are instances where we talk about music only with the help of Konoko without the help of any instruments you know it is so so well defined and also it's something that is related so much to the the patterns and the numbers 
everything. So it's imbibed. So it's only thing is like, just treat it as another speaking language. Let us say, uh, let us say it's one of the Aboriginal Indian languages. That's what mm -hmm. I would like to call it as, you know? <laughs> so, but it's, it's not, it might not be as difficult as some other Aboriginal language. If you are a musician already, if you're not a musician already, if you know numbers, how to deal with numbers, because that's something that we deal with every day in and out. We are always looking at numbers. We are dealing with numbers. Uh, everything that we do around us, uh, consciously, subconsciously, it's all about numbers. So Konokol is something that you deal with numbers, at least to start with. Then once you start knowing more and more, it becomes like it gets to the subconscious level, like just like uh, you're driving a car, how to learn to drive a car. You are like, okay, now I have to turn my steering. Okay, what is next? Okay, I have to press my brake or oh, the accelerator, the clutch. The, you know, it's it, it starts like that, but afterwards mm -hmm. it becomes very, very natural. Then it starts translating into your other forms of music or or other forms of living in your daily life. Mm. Okay, there's yeah, there's a couple of things I'd like to pick up from there. So the first is the word language, um, which is so expansive, but I suppose there's kind of, the way I think about spoken languages, it has two very different aspects. There's the, um, the words, or in common call the syllables, um, and then there's how they are spoken, um, the what and the how, I suppose. Um, so we have, um, when I'm speaking, it, I'm speaking words, but I'm also, well, the intonation is putting across so much meaning. It's like there's these two channels of meaning, um, the kind of um, syntactic or semantic, but also the prosody, the kind of, the rhythm of the language, but also the pitch of the language. Um, you can completely change a sentence just by very subtle intonation. Um, and I suppose this is true of conical as well. Um, well, uh, intonation is one of the, the key factors of conical uh -huh. because there are many aspects that's been believed to make uh, conical sounding exciting. It need not be speed, it not, need not be uh, clarity, but the way you say the same thing, because as far as I know, one of the greatest, a lot of great musicians in this world, they don't play a lot of things, but they play the same thing with different intonations every time, which mm. conveys different kinds of moods. You know, it's always like they are like kind of like projecting the, the mood of the audience or the mood of the artist on the stage or the combination of the mood of both audience and the artist, right? So for me, intonation is, is, is the first thing that I have to learn in Konoko. Mm. Like, for example, the first basic four syllables is ta, thi, tom, nam, you know? You can mm. simply say ta, thi, tom, nam. But there is a way to say this, you know, right? I always say, like, think that you're talking to a kid don't be very aggressive when you deal with it, right? So, ta, dhi, it's like, come here, baby. What are you doing? Do you want to have some food? You know, you cannot say, hey, come here. You want to have some food? Okay. <laughs> I've got this this puree and then why don't you just eat it? No, I cannot do that. I feel like, I'm here, kid. Like, I have prepared some puree to you. You know, like, why don't you just have something? And then the same way I treat the konokol as also. Like, you know, like, ta, dhi. Tom, nam, you know, uh, one way of like addressing it with a lot of love and then as if like you're speaking. This is one of the moods because Konokol can create a lot of emotions. And then I always intend to start with this kind of like kind kindness. And then mm -hmm. when you think of like ta, dhi, tom, nam, where these first three letters are asking questions like ta, which is going up, dhi, tom, nam. Nam is like the one, okay, you guys, you three guys ask me this question, but this is the answer, Nam, you know, Nam. Mm. So you can do, you can also make Ta, Di, Tom, Nam. You know, like three people are answering, but Nam is still not convinced. You can say, <laughs> okay, look, I'm not convinced. 
num like this is what you said hey d did you say that you know like i mean like it's all about storytelling you know you cannot you cannot present any art form without having a story it, it is not bunch of notes it's not bunch of musical notes or rhythmic notes or the idea or the concepts of numbers or rhythms or or the harmony there has to be a storytelling behind whatever you want to do you imagine something it's okay because you know for me music is something like uh your it's like drawing your painting notes in the silence mm -hmm. so and then at the end it's also at the same time very abstract because you're thinking of a story but it's not literally explained through mm -hmm. the language which you already know it's something very alien for you but still at the same time let us say you're talking gibberish but by the intention of you saying it by the intention of your intonations you can actually get what you're trying to say you know the more mm -hmm. you get deep into this language you can easily get what you're trying to say but for me the most important thing at the end of a performance is to leave the audience not with answers but with a lot of questions they should have mm -hmm. a lot of questions they should interpret my story in their way in their own way and they should come up so that's like you know it's like to be continued i should not have an answer everything is to be continued in art nothing has an answer mm. thank you that's such a nice way of introducing conical um uh, I, i suppose so how do you feel then when you are sharing a recording of a conical performance um and how does that feel different from performing it with a live audience? Um, I'm thinking about when when you're performing, people just hear it once. It's um, they come with their own stories and they sort of fit it in with the story that you're telling. Um, but when you're sharing a recording of performance, um, in a way, it's the same every time someone watches it. Um, but I find myself watching the same conical performances that you've put online over and over again and getting something very different each time. Um, I think this is something quite new in the last sort of few decades that we can experience the same sound waves over and over again, but somehow it doesn't feel the same each time I listen to it. Um, so, yeah, do you approach um, uh, composing something for a recording differently from approaching a recital, a live recital? Well, I have I have journeyed a long time in my life, especially with when it comes to uh, Konokol, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it start just to just to take uh, your your talk a little bit further. Mm -hmm. You said that you feel different every time you listen to it. Mm -hmm. It is not me. Mm -hmm. It is you who feel it different because every time you listen to something or you watch something or you talk to somebody, you are coming from a place where you went through a, some kind of emotion. And then mm -hmm. the, the state of mind that you're in and the state of mind that I recorded trying to say a story. And then for some people, you know, like it's not that they everyone likes what they see or what they listen to because it can be at a time where because uh, sound is something it's related to vibrations right mm -hmm. so when it, it because because of the five senses and uh, uh, added quality of looking at the video is that you can actually see where it is coming from so it's not that you're listening to an audio piece and then you kind of like imagine but now you can also e imagine the expression you don't have to imagine you can actually see what i'm trying to do mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you can actually try to see what kind of emotions i'm trying to give th through our uh, through my face you know so at the same time your emotion is different at that time it need not be the same every time you listen to my video or any other music at the same time, if you listen to me doing the same piece another time, it might not sound the same because I might not be in the same mood again. I might have come from home after like playing with my kids one day. So I'm really happy and I want to express it through my music. And I want to say a story about what I went through in my house or maybe I had a fight with my wife. So I'm, I'm really like, I just want to express that anger or 
I had something really nice. Like I went out with my family and then, or like something like I met a beautiful friend and, you know, all these things are going through my mind. So that will certainly reflect in my music. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same with everyone, you know, ask a person to do the same thing. I know that they might be doing the same musical notes. They might do the same uh, uh, rhythmic patterns. They might do exactly the same composition, but it will sound different because they are going through different emotions at the same time. You know, it's not the same that they are. If you hear the same thing, then that means that the thing that you heard before from them and the same thing that you heard now, they probably went through the same emotions like what they did the other day. <laughs> I think it's the same with you, with the listener. It's always like that. Mm. That is the beauty of especially uh, arts. Arts is something that that directly connects to uh, heart first. That's how it should be. And mm. then when you start investigating, and then it should go into your mind. It should never start from your mind. It will not last longer. Mm -hmm. If it starts from your heart, let us say I, I reach your heart on the because it might not be uh, a very complex thing that I do, but something that attractive. Okay, okay. I don't even know what he's doing, but it really looks nice. Oh, it sounds nice. Then that's the, I, I captured your heart. And then slowly it's going up towards your mind because I, you can leave it there. You can come back and then you can watch it. You don't want to investigate. So it stays there. But some people further investigate that and then try to take it into their life. It need not be konoko, it need not be rhythm, it need not be music. A lot of people get inspired to do something else looking at this. The same way mm -hmm. what I do. I watch a lot of movies. It's not just I just listen to music. It's not just I listen to Carnatic music. It's not just that I listen to konoko or Mridangam. I do a lot of things and I, I try to take inspiration from... I always ask question why it is there at this moment like that. So the moment I start asking why, I start becoming better as a musician. <laughs> very nice. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to hear you on one side talking about emotion and the relationship between the, the heart and the mind and um, and these stories of life. But then also um, earlier you were talking about numbers and how um, numbers are everywhere and, um, uh, and and at the same time this is um, as I understand it um, a really old um, tradition ancient tradition um, so but but then kind of this experience of living in a world made of numbers is something that we maybe associate with modern times so with computers and these algorithms and Facebook, whatever, controlling us and and, and uh, people talking about spreadsheets and things as if they're controlling us. And um, but this seems like uh, there's something similar between. I mean, as someone who uses only computers really to make music and writes algorithms to make music, um, I find it very interesting this kind of balance between the numerical and the emotional. Um, this is something we maybe don't talk about very much in the world of algorithmic music. Um, so I think what I'm trying to get at is um, you're kind of jumping between this very discrete world of numbers and very structural world and then this very dis um, kind of uh, analog world of emotions um, and stories and life. Um, how, are, are these two things which are coming together or do you see them all part of the same thing? Mm -hmm. Well, emotion is not something that can be forced. Uh -huh. This is what I, I have understood. So emotion is something that comes to the realization because you like something, but you don't know what it is. But the moment mm. you start knowing what, what is you, what you're going through, I think that's the final stage. So you cannot force that final stage already in the beginning. You know, you have to, like, for example, you're asking about numbers and conocol. Mm -hmm. So every number can be uh, given a kind of a sound in, uh, in, in rhythmic language. It can be conocol. I have heard a lot of uh, uh, vocal uh, 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 syllabic art form because 
I was once in Sri Lanka. They have their own kind of like uh, uh, rhythmic syllables, which is mm-hmm. so beautiful and interesting. And uh, there is also like, uh, you know, like for me, uh, beatboxing is mm-hmm. uh, probably uh, is one of kind of conical, you know, because they're mm-hmm. trying to imitate some some drum or some sounds that they listen to. And then they are trying it further into creating new sounds, which not, might not be even there. So mm-hmm. that is what probably a computer expert would like to catch that and then try to make a sound of it and then maybe merge with something else, you know, this, all these things will happen. So the same thing happens with, with Konokol also, like, for example, uh, in, in a very common layman's language, if I have to explain, let us say if one, if you want to count one, then there is a, a syllable for that. It can be ta or dhi or tom or nam, ki, tam, like all kinds of syllables that you can utter thinking of this drum, which is called as mridangam. So mm. that's how kon- konokol, I think, is trying to do these days. Because as you, as a lot of people might have read, it has like 5,000 year, year history, all these things. I'm not a, an expert uh, historian or anything. I just mm. do, I'm a very emotional musician. And then I just do what I listen to. And then my, ma- my, my, my father, my teacher, they were all amazing Konokol experts. So mm. uh, one of my teachers who is still alive and uh, is one of the greatest Mridangam artists and also uh, a great Konokol expert, Dr. TK Murthy. So I listened to them and then I've been doing this all the all my life, you know, so at least 40 mm. years now. So, so ta is one. And then if you want like one, two, one, two, one, two, you can do ki, ta, ki, ta, ki, ta, ki, ta. Then if you want to do one, two, three, one, two, three, one. They can be takkita, takkita, takkita. It's not just this combination of syllables. Then you mm-hmm. can do dhinnaka, 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 tatakka, 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 tadhimbi, tadhimbi, tadhimbi. You know, if you're doing one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, tatakka, tatakka, it's very plain and simple. But I'm trying to put some life into it. Dhinnaka, 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 which might sound like let us say a kangaroo jumping. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like you can't think of anything. I'm not trying to, uh, like, trying to force you to think about something in this. Mm-hmm. Something like, I would always say that. Okay, close your eyes, or if you just try to think of what this translates to you as some kind of movement or moods or something like that. That only happens with the intonations. Mm-hmm. It, cannot happen without the intonations for me the moods and emotions can come through the intonations and with the the proper way of connecting the notes for example uh, there is this this word called as liaison in uh, in french mm-hmm. so for example tarikita 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 it's so like one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four if i want to make it sound more interesting tarikita 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 or tarikita 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 and then if i want to connect the notes tarikita 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 tada 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 you know all these kinds of like going up and down you know like that happens through uh uh through a lot of intonations mm. and then of course clarity is something if you don't have clarity like for example even speaking english you know if you're mumbling nobody can Mm -hmm. understand anything and they don't get attracted you know amazing speakers in this world they have clarity and they have clarity of thoughts and they have clarity of speech at the same time they have the right speed and tone and intonation to what they do you know, even if they are talking about something v- really stupid and rubbish, it is still attractive because the way they choose the tone and the, the clarity of thought, the clarity of of, uh, of speech and the intonation and the speed. That's how that's that's what we have to do with Kono Kohl. Mm-hmm. Um So how does the pulse fit, fit into this? Um, I think. So when we're on, in conical videos, you see um, the musician clapping um, in quite complex, but um, repeating uh, usually um, structures. Um, so it seems like there's this flow of syllables and then this kind of grounding 
of, of uh, clapping underneath. Um, is this the Tala? How, how, how does this fit in with uh, the experience and, and the practice of Comical? If I drive something parallel to, uh, uh, to Western classical music, mm -hmm. you have a conductor who is separated, who is separate from musicians, right? Yeah. Who is somebody who is not doing the music, but he is actually guiding the whole orchestra. Mm. But in Carnatic music, we don't need conductors. Uh -huh. We are our own conductors. And this Tala is nothing but we are trying to conduct ourselves and then our co-musicians and also we are trying to show what we are doing with respect to our pulse. Uh -huh. So this is self-conducting and then a Tala cannot be simply said as a rhythmic cycle. Uh -huh. If I want to just in a diluted way translate that into, into Western perspective of what it is, you can just say it's a rhythmic cycle because Tala is not a rhythmic cycle. It has mm -hmm. 10 different kinds of elements in it. Tala ha is something that you can show, right? You can hear and not hear. And yeah. then it has a specific way of doing, which is called as Anga. And then it has a cyclic system, which is called as Avarta. Mm -hmm. And then it also has something which is called as the place where you start in the Tala because and let us say if let me clearly explain let us say if you if we have a rhythmic cycle of seven uh -huh. let me talk about how we think in the west they have a way to describe it one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven one two three one two three four one two three one two three four one two three one two three four or one two three four one two three one two three four one two three but this is the combination of numbers that uh, they are doing but unless they they express it through their mouth you can't really say what cycle it is but in in carnatic music we have different ways of showing seven it can be two plus five one two one two three four five one two one two or it can be three three plus four one two three one two three four these are the frames like mini frames like it's like let us say you have small houses where you can build your own stuff Mm -hmm. And uh, like this, there are, if, if people are interested, they can just go and see Dasha Pranas in this, this will make up a Tala. Without these 10 elements, you cannot call it as a Tala. And okay. what I do like clapping and turning like this, this is called as Dhruta. And then clapping and counting fingers is called as Laghu. Clapping is Anadhruta. So, I just told you about three parts of a tala, which is called as angas, but there are 16 such parts in a tala. And then yeah. it can get, there are many kinds of systems of talas in, in Carnatic music. Like for example, we learned four basic talas, which is eight, seven, eight, three, four, and five, eight as uh, time signatures. Then afterwards we start learning 35 different tala systems. Then we also, if we are still alive, if we can understand at the end of it, then we can investigate in something which is called as 108 Tala systems, where the longest Tala is 128 beats long. One cycle is, which, which is com combination of these kind of parts, you know? So that is the longest Tala that I have been introduced to from my guru and my father. Mm -hmm. And there is 72 Tala system. There is 175 Tala system. And my father used to tell me there is also a 1008 Tala system. So it's, <laughs> even just to learn what these Talas are, one lifetime is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you want to be, uh, you cannot be complex for the, just for the, for the sake of being complex. You know, mm -hmm. how does complexity or complicated, com I would not, Complex and complicate is totally different. So complex is something that, uh, let us say, you make paella, right? In in, uh, in in a Spanish dish, which has a lot of elements in it. It's not. It is complicated for a person who wants to understand what it is. But it is built over many simple things. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. If there are a lot of simple things which is imbibed into each other, that becomes complex, right? So you cannot become complex just for being the becoming the sake of it, right? So you have to get bored by doing a lot of simple, simple things. That's that makes you just go just like playing video game, you know. You play level one, you're bored, you go to level two. So you're getting complex in that. The same way you cannot force complexity. If you understand that you're trying to make something complex, then, then, then that is really a failure of a musician. The complexity should be for others, but for me, it should be simple. <laughs> yes, this is, yeah, I really like this. I think um, there's a really important message for music technologists in there, um, such as myself. It reminds me of um, a local musician called Mark Fell, who talks about this in a similar way. Um, I think a lot of music technology looks for the complicated, for the impressive. Um, but when you have these simple elements that are coming together to make complexity, um, you have to be humble because <laughs> just like a few simple elements that you combine can interfere with each other and create such amazing complexity. Um, and then when you have that, you can go back to those simple elements make a tiny adjustments, whether it's an intonation, making something slightly faster or slower, um, and everything changes, just changing that very simple thing. Um, and I think that's kind of the essence of pattern. It's a very humbling thing that um, such simple operations, um, just counting up or counting down, um, when you um, combine it with something else, you just get this explosion of possibility. <laughs> um, but yeah, the real pleasure for Conical for me is just the pleasure of learning it. Everything, um, when you learn something new, you kind of see a little bit more of the picture and everything else um, changes and freshens up. It's, um, it's an amazing experience. Um, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it's great. Um, but um, yeah, so we're uh, over halfway through already. Already, Time is going very fast. And I was thinking about how in Conical time really... Um, changes when you're making these adjustments and, and dealing with these very long piles. Uh, it's just um, a way of expanding the awareness of time in a beautiful way. But unfortunately, we have to deal with clock time here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was wondering if you could um, maybe recite a little um, piece uh, for us to um, sort of frame the discussion a bit more before we take some questions from the floor. Would, would you be um, sure. up for doing that? Oh, what what do you want to listen to? <laughs> do you have a rhythmic cycle in your mind? Um, I think maybe something uh, quite uh, that maybe has simple um, aspects that come together into complexity, if that's possible. Something that builds up so that we can, okay. um, for us now, we can follow into this complexity. That'd be amazing. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, seven. So I'm going to count seven. Okay. And then I'm going to count it in a particular way, which is not too fast, not too slow. So mm -hmm. let us say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am going to put a cycle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three. Ta ka di mi ta ki ta. One, two, three, four. Ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta ki ta ta ka di ta ki ta ta ka di ta ki ta ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta ki ta ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta ka jendra ta ki ta ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta ki ta ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta ka jendra ta ki ta ta ka di di ta ka ta ki ta ka ta ka di ka ta ka ta ka di ki ta ta ka di di ta ka ta ka ki ta ka ta ka ta ka di ka 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 ta Takata 
just amazing that you're able to just jump into that um although yeah it was a nice introduction in in there so thank you very much for that um i think that one of the stranger things of being quite a naive listener is that i'm unclear about the extent to which this is improvised and to the extent to which you're bringing in classical compositions or or whether it's all pre-composed could you say a little bit about that perhaps okay this is a very, very, very beautiful question that I like to answer every time. And then okay. it is something that uh, I'm trying to create awareness of what I do, not about what others do. Mm. Uh, what is improvisation? Okay. Because, for example, right now, because I didn't know uh, what I was going to start with, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just started, you know, I have tools to build stuff, right? It's like mm. you give uh, uh, a canvas and then you give some colors and some brush to a painter, then ask him or her to paint something and they just they just do it, right? And uh, they don't really have to uh, be asked or prepared, be prepared to do something. It's the same way. Like I'm trying to color picture. Uh, I'm like, I'm trying to paint the sounds over silence, okay? Mm. And then I'm creating my own frames to build it's like playing lego for me but mm. what is improvisation according to please i will ask you a question what is improvisation um improvisation for me i think it's um it i think it's like a sort of craft approach where you're responding to your material um wow so you're kind of following you're making something you're not quite sure what's going to happen um and as it's emerging, you're responding to this thing that you're making. So it's like a dialogue with the piece that you're... You know what? With. You just didn't... Uh, I mean, like, I have nothing to answer after you have answered no. this question. <laughs> but trying to, trying to put it in my words, okay? okay. Because yeah. it's exactly what I think it is. And then mm. bravo to you because you, you just nailed it. Improvisation is something that you're pulling out all the tricks that you have, that you have already prepared with. Yeah. And trying to compile it in different way every time you approach it. Mm. A lot of a lot of people think that improvisation is some, trying to create something new over there. No, you're not mm. trying to create something new because first of all, I would say that there is nothing to create 
new in uh, in music it's only kind kind of like trying to create new compilations of what is already you're always trying to put it in a different way than someone else did or different way than the way you did before you know that's improvisation for me so in this what i did today was i started out i, I that's why i did not want to choose it so fast so the the slower i i start i it gives me time to think of what to do next right mm -hmm. it's not happening that i'm not trying to create over there just split second before or maybe one cycle before i'm i know what i'm going to do next yeah so okay. but yeah. everything that i did there were maybe two or three compositions which is classical compositions which i uh -huh. took as uh, a savior for me you know like uh, at that moment i didn't because classical compositions compositions that's already done time tested is something that is very beautiful at the same time it's also a savior you know like you already learned it so you can just present it you don't mm -hmm. have to do anything you just have to do justice to these compositions mm -hmm. but the way i compiled it the way i did the whole solo not even not even a, a, a tiny little bit of it was already thought of for me from my side before it was all improvised on the spot mm. wow yeah the, i'm gonna have to think about that a long time the idea of um there not being anything new in music i think there's an interesting philosoph philosophical um approach um but I, I should stop uh taking all the questions because uh we're already no, just uh, just to just to add to that okay yeah sure every <laughs> everything should be in 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 the time limit that you give from one one beat to next beat or between those musical notes that you have discovered right mm. it cannot be maybe you we will find different combinations of notes which will be new from the perspective of somebody who has done it before or not that's all mm -hmm. so otherwise it's all discoveries for me yeah yeah so much to learn um, so um there's there's a lot of questions that people sent in advance actually we're not going to be able to get through them all um let, let's have a look at this one from um fabrice um are there rules for melodic patterns other than rhythmic for example melodic contour and this makes me think about one of the videos which i watch a lot which i also put on the algorithmicpattern.org page for this event with uh varish varijashri benigopal um yeah. a vocalist um and it was very nice having the juxtaposition between your um syllables and her syllables which she was actually singing um could you say a bit about this question and also relate it perhaps to that to that collaboration with the singer well according to me rhythmic patterns uh are easier compared to melodic mm -hmm. patterns okay. because you know uh in Indian music, because that's where I'm coming from, that's what I understand. I don't want to speak to speak about every music that's in the world. I'm not I'm not generalizing anything here. Uh -huh. In Indian music, we have a system which is called as a, a raga, uh -huh. where raga is again. I cannot just simply translate that into Western context where they say it's a melodic cycle. It is not melodic cycle, because um, a raga is of course a way of going ascending and descending from one note to from the tonic note to up and coming back at the mm -hmm. same time it also has its own characteristics because every raga is coming from another raga so you, it's like kind of like parent and scale if there is a parent itself you know it has its own rules the way you ascend the way you you touch another note it need not be it cannot be like if you just know the the, the melodic cycle you can improvise it depends mm. on which raga you're doing it. So that means they must know those rules. And then at the same time, they also have to do the rhythmic patterns, you know, mm. because if I do they cannot just say, uh, you know, they have a lot of rules to approach it. So mm. that is only possible if you are an experienced musician and if you are a knowledge knowledgeable musician and then you have if you have done it for a long time mm -hmm. and then that's how you're also like making it look fascinating beautiful and then very emotional it's only possible if you have spent a lot of time in this 
And then, yes, there are a lot of rules for melodic patterns. That is to answer mm -hmm. Mr. Fabric's uh, question. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm looking for another question. Um, yeah, this kind of leads to this from Javier. Um, could you comment with thoughts and opinions on computer systems for generating patterns and or the possibility of formalizing and implementing conical principles? So I think because you talk about rules a lot, but are these really the kind of rules that can be formalized? Um, are they that strict, that well-defined? Um, can they exist on paper? Um, uh, you mean to say down? that the rules of Conocol, you mean? Mm. Well, rules are always redefined. Huh? Mm. It's not something that is uh, static, mm. right? You learn a rule. You break the rule and that becomes the new norm that becomes the rule. Mm. Then the already defined rule, the area of already defined rule becomes larger. And then you teach it to someone else. They learn this rule. Some people want to stay in the same circle, but some people want to forget half of it and then maybe remember half of it. And they, they break the rule that becomes another norm, mm. you know? So rules are always being set. Mm. And, but there are always like thumb rules, which is there, which need not, which, which, which must not be broken. Okay. And these, these rules are so strong because it's very hard to break them because everything, because these are time tested rules. You try to question them. There is always an answer, but you have to be intelligent enough to find the answer. Mm -hmm. So person who knows the rules really well. Only that person can break the rule mm. and then still make it sound convincing. For yeah. example, to take this, uh, this, this question from Javier, uh, whatever the computer systems are generating, you know, you can actually, whatever sound you listen to, you can actually reproduce that with Conocol. Mm -hmm. And it is possible that we can formalize and implement in, in, in Conocol. But I don't know if, if, if you can do the same thing, vice versa. Mm. Because no. human body, the, the vocal, the, the, the sound of the human body is probably the most advanced way of thinking of sound than any computer in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this idea of a rule which is there to be broken, not all rules, as you say, but... Um, they're, they're just there to kind of set a creative space or something, I suppose. Um, I think this idea is very diff difficult to formalize with a computer. Um, and I think it's also a bit hard to conceptualize. Like I'm so used to the idea of music being something that's written down um, and then it's kind of fixed in a way, whereas would you say Conocol was more of a, um, I mean, I, I understand there is notation for, for Conocol, but it seems to have a different um, a different role in music making. Um, so I, I suppose I'm trying to say or ask, um, is, is, is Conocol, is, is the kind of vocal, the way that it, it's um, transmitted from person to person through practice rather than through notation. I, I suppose that um, e even though it is so kind of based on numbers, it's also based on um, practice rather than the notation. Does that, is, is that something about how it's difficult to formalize the fact that it is so fluid in the way that it's transmitted from person to person? I love these questions, Alex. You really <laughs> ask me some really beautiful questions. It's, it's the same example as which came out first, hen or egg, you know? Yeah. But for <laughs> me, uh, for me, I have an answer for this because I'm sure the notation did not exist on the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something that, that, that came after you created something. But it's the notation is something that will help you to remember things after you have forgotten, mm. right? Uh, 
if you are a very good notator let us say like if you mm. can notate what you do or if you have a system just like what you have with the staff notation in the west uh, where everyone kind of like seem to understand each other even like somebody from 18th century who has written uh, music on on the on the on the paper is being mm. interpreted i don't know if it was the same way that the composer thought about it but somehow they read the same way like you put it uh, in front of a musician in, in in germany or in new york or in uh, or in uh, poland you know they all interpret it almost in the same way but indian music did not emerge through notation notation mm. is only happening now and then i think notation in indian system is kind of a it can be a strength but for me i think it's you are more powerful as a musician if you can remember things and then if you learn orally mm. the less you refer to the notation the much more uh, uh, stronger will be your music mm. but you are forced to do a then that means that you're limited to do a small not so many things if you want to do a lot of things then you cannot remember so many things so mm -hmm. notation should happen and then if we don't have a common notation system i think they are still uh, fighting over it, like which which should be commonized and and then i have my own notation and then i always mm -hmm. uh, make a joke about it i can read my notation even after 10 years you give me the same notation i forgot about it i can read it but even when i'm writing it the person next to me Five minutes later, cannot read my notation. Okay. They don't understand <laughs> a thing about it. So that's the way it is with me. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, a way of protecting the oral tradition, I think. Yeah, the, there's similar things in the UK as well. In Scotland, there's um, the Cantoric. I don't know if you know this. It's um, with the bagpipes and this very loud instrument. Um, they have this way of representing different articulations with different words and it's used in refrain as well. Um, but I think this tradition is being lost um, and because staff notation has taken over so much. Um, so yeah, I, I think this idea of keeping things um, alive in living memory is um, something which, um, yeah, we should uh, uh, think about, especially me just working with computers. What does that even mean when uh, everything I do is notated and goes through the notation? Right. If I don't notate something, there's no sound because I need I mean, computer. like as far as, if, as long as you can do it with your memory, mm. I think you should stick to that. Notation should only come when it becomes becomes humanly impossible. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I like the idea. What I try to do is notate things during a performance and then throw away that notation at the end so that you know, notation is oh, just wow. there for the live performance. We call it live coding, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to take a question from the live audience. Um, so let's see. Um, Okay, this comes over to uh, comments from another Javier. Um, mm -hmm. Some drummers um, are noted for playing polyrhythms with different limbs, five against seven against four. They talk about in interdependence, not independence. Um, and then it continues. Um, they know how the rhythms in each line feel and where the accents land in relation to each other. Is it a similar relationship between this vocalization and the clapping hands? Javier Relay. <laughs> this is exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. It is not independent. It's all interdependent. Uh -huh. You approach to a, a particular beat, uh, if it is in seven or five or four, it is all interdependent. And then you, you, you perceive it as one pattern altogether. Mm. You might, for some time, isolate one of the rhythms and then listen to it. But at the same time, still it is interconnected and it's not independent. For me, at least, it is interdependent. Mm. This reminds me of reading um, a, um, a scholar, uh, Justin London, writing about polyrhythm. I think, I'm, I think I'm remembering this right. I might be misrepresenting him. <laughs> But um, I think he has the idea that there's only one um, meter 
um, in perception. Like if you're listening to a polyrhythm, you're only listening to one one of the rhythms with respect to the other. Um, in Col in Conical, would you say that actually it's much more balanced than that, and you can experience things as a whole? Um, at well, least you know like how that's the polyrhythm exist in conical is like you you kind of like uh, do in two different hands and mm -hmm. some people also do it with two different legs and uh, the knees and then this and <laughs> then neck there are people who who could do eight different rhythmic cycles at the same time <laughs> i have seen right. it i have seen it. it it's not a very pleasant sight to look at but we really have to give it give it away for them like because i'm 100 percent sure that they, they don't think independently they always think in in in, a, in an interdependent way i would say okay um maybe we can take one more question yes one more question so i'm just looking at the advanced questions um so what's a good one to finish with um perhaps this one um do you have any conical exercises for other instruments, specifically guitar? I've been enjoying some of the uh, videos you've shared where people have covered your compositions on very different instruments. I think I saw one with the death metal performer. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, conical exercises are conical exercises. And then you have to, uh, uh, Josh Brown, you have to find a way to interpret that on your instrument. There is nothing that is specific to done for an instrument f f through conical. You have mm -hmm. to find uh, uh, the way to relate it to your instrument and at the same time, not trying to literally translate it into your instrument, but try to find the counterpoints or maybe use conical as one of uh, a tool that improves your, uh, strengthens your inner pulse, you know. There are a lot of, lot of, uh, you might ask Alex, it might have, I've seen that, uh, a person, he's a person of full of surprises. Alex is one of an amazing personality for me. He's always surprising me. And I think it, Konokol is really helping uh, him to, to improve his inner pulse because mm -hmm. he realizes or not, but I can see that his inner pulse is improving. The same way, like there are a lot of advantages from Konokol, which we can leave it for another day. I can speak about it. I speak uh, go on and on about it, but uh, <laughs> uh, we will talk about it some other day. So please do uh, learn conical, but not uh, something that that is related to guitar or drums. I don't think it works like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yeah, thanks so much for uh, being here and sharing your practice and thoughts and Thank philosophies. You. Thanks um, you for having me. It's been amazing because uh, you're a great. Uh, interviewer because you you're very patient you listen to you don't cut me off you're <laughs> listening to me and then you're not oh, just being me. there a passive listener you're an active listener so you always try to co connect from previous question to the next question through my talk and then all these things so i had a great time like oh, I, say, I can also see a lot of friends of mine who are in the comment section so oh, <laughs> I, I i thanks thank them and everyone else who is there who, who came all, all the way and gave their time, you know, like it's very easy to give money or anything else to other people, but to give time mm. to some, someone else is probably the most precious thing to do. And that's what I appreciate a lot by you or anyone else who is present here. Thank you so oh. much. <laughs> oh, you're so generous with your time and thoughts and everything. Um, and thank you so much again. Um, thanks also to Wendy Osmond, who's had the challenge of creating live captions for the conical and <laughs> Perfect. this has been fun um, and uh, yeah so the next talk will be next week um, you can check algorithmicpattern.org for the details but for now um, we'll say goodbye thanks again bye bye um, see you everyone see you yeah. bye